I'd like to welcome everyone here. Appreciate you come out and help celebrate our ancestors. Ancestors, so love to have it. Glad to have everybody with you. Uh, introduce our speaker, Chris Wetman. He, I'll go into that later. But I want to introduce Buzz Braxton, Eighth Brigade Commander. Forget about him. So also the Port Alexander camp for the reenactors. So be thankful for them for all the heat they're going through today. This time I'm gonna have Chris do the invocation. You would stand, gentlemen, uncover, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today. Lord, we humbly ask that you would bless our endeavors, that you would guide and direct us, that you would be with us. Dear Lord, give us the words to say that will bring glory and honor to you and not ourselves. Dear Lord, we pray that you would be with the state of South Carolina and with the Southland. Dear Lord, bless us. Lord, strengthen us. Lord, we pray for the people of this nation. Lord, we just ask that you would be with us. Lord, we go forth from here today that we would be ambassadors of Christ. Lord, we pray your blessing over this ceremony today. We pray for each and every one that's come to participate in it. We pray for each and every one that's come to sit and watch. Lord, we just thank you for all that are involved. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. We're set. Colors. Everything I have today will be in your program other than the American flag players. Charge the Sons of Confederate Veterans. To you, Sons of Confederate Veterans, we submit the vindication of the cause for which we fought. To your strength be given the defense of Confederate soldiers' good name, the guardianship of his history, the emulation of his virtues, the perpetuation of those principles he loved and which made him glorious and which you also cherished. Remember, it is your duty to see that the true history of the South is presented to future generations. Lieutenant General Stephen Bill Lee, 1906. Amen. Shoulder, arms. Pledge Freeze the it. American flag, arms. hand over heart. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. To the state flag, hand over heart. I salute the flag of South Carolina. Pledge to my land and state, love, loyalty, and faith. To the Confederate flag, hand over heart. I salute the flag of South Carolina. Pledge to my land and state, love, loyalty, and faith. To the Confederate flag, hand over heart. I salute the Confederate flag with reverence and affection. I'm not a devotion to the cause for which it stands. At this time, I'm not, Mr. Benny Creech, reenactor's got a poem he wants to read, so we're going to put that up ahead of the speaker. Mr. Benny? These guys have been through Orange St. Matthews today? No, no, we didn't get This is a poem that was written by a distant cousin's husband's great grandfather. He was one. Faith Carol Creek Chapman. Her great grandfather and my great grandfather were brothers. Her great grandfather was Lewis Creek. He's buried out there in friendship. And this was written by Private Augusta David Troutman in the city of Troutman, North Carolina. It was named after this family. He was in the 2nd North Carolina Cavalry, Company B, 
the poem was written in 1925. This year is why we're here to celebrate and remember what they did so long ago. Is it a dream or is it a bugle call? I think I hear. What makes me think of the jacket of gray I used to wear? That jacket of gray I wore to defend the Confederacy. That jacket of gray was worn on a many cold winter day. That jacket of gray was worn on many a hot summer day. That old jacket of gray saw the mighty battles waged in Pennsylvania. That old jacket of gray was worn in the Battle of Grand Spotsylvania. That old jacket of gray was worn where shells did burst and balls did fly, where men did fall and bravely die. That jacket was worn in prisons far away. That jacket of gray in the heart and memory is worn by veterans today. It will be worn by veterans till the last is under the clay. The, member, the memory of that bloodstained jacket of gray may be tenderly folded away, laid away. That was written by Private Augustus David Chapman in 1925. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Senator. Okay, at this time I'm going to introduce Chris Webman. Chris is a pastor of Air, Earhart Southern Methodist Church. Also, he's a he's an SCV member with 842 Rivers Bridge and he's a Lieutenant Commander of 8th Brigade. He's also with Santee Light Artillery and Reenactment. I want to congratulate Chris. I want to begin by welcoming everybody to Barnwell today to honor the Southern soldiers who bravely and courageously defended the South in the war for Southern independence. I want to thank Commander Bodiford and the 17th Regiment SCB Camp and Hilda for inviting me to speak today. I told Jerry, uh, when he asked me to speak over at their camp a couple weeks ago, that could be dangerous, you know, to let a preacher take the microphone, right, Jerry? <laughs> they asked me if I was Baptist. Said, no, I'm Southern Methodist. When I speak on historical events, or when anyone speaks on historical events, it is preferred to use the words of the men and women who lived during that era. It's important to view history and to view historical events through the eyes of the men and women who lived and made history. Our problem now is we're looking backwards on history from a 21st century perspective. And it doesn't make sense to look at it that way. We have to look at it in their eyes. And I'm gonna use some quotes today from men who were alive during that era and men who served during the war. I'm also going to share some poetry that was written to honor the Southern dead and the sacrifice they gave for self-determination. As members of the Sons of Confederate Veterans, it's always important to remember the charge that was read just a few moments ago that Lieutenant General Stephen Neal Lee gave Pay particularly close attention to the end of the charge when he says this. Remember, it is our duty to see that the true history of the South is presented to future generations. So I'm going to ask you today, and I'm going to contend that to teach true history, one must start by knowing the history. If I was in church, I'd say amen right there, right? Amen. Amen. You have to know history. You have to know the true history and you have to do some leg work and you have to do some intellectual work to learn the true history. You cannot just turn on the television and get spoon fed what the media wants to give you on the six o'clock news. You have to do some self-education. 
This is entitled The Southern Dead. The Southern Dead are sleeping in a thousand southern glens. The moss and willows beckon, the breath of southern winds. Through the blood-stained cross of St. Andrew is tattered now and furled. They bore it high on every field and o'er every ocean of the world. It wasn't through their failing that the gleaming turned to rust and the dreaming of a nation is enshrined within their dust. Some would have their deeds forgot, their monument swept away. But while Southern blood flows in our veins, those knaves shall never see the day. Teach your children of their story, of battles lost and won. They must keep memories light of burning till Southern rivers cease to run. The Southern dead are sleeping. Robert Louis Dabney was one of the chaplains that served with General Thomas Jonathan Jackson during the war. And he said this, Sirs, you have no reason to be ashamed of your Confederate dead. See to it that they have no reason to be ashamed of you. Amen. As we stand here today, in the year of our Lord Jesus Christ, 2022, let us not forget the valor, the bravery, and the struggle of the Southern soldier. The Southern soldier left his family, he sacrificed his treasure, and in many cases, he had very little to speak of, except for life and limb. And many of them gave that and gave their lives to defend their beloved home, the South. We owe these Southern Patriots honor and respect for fighting for life, for liberty, and the Constitution. Contrary to what's taught now, the men who wore this gray and the uniforms like these men over here, they are the men that actually fought and defended the Constitution of the United States. Amen. between 1861 and 1865. Yeah. I encourage each of you to research your ancestors and to determine if they served their state, because that's who they ultimately serve as their state. My, my ancestors that I've been digging and trying to, to find them all, and I'm still working on it, but most of them served South Carolina. I just found a couple that served in Alabama and Georgia. It's an interesting and rewarding endeavor to research your family history and to see what these men and these women did. And one of the cultural issues that we have in our country now is that we are disconnected from the past. We're disconnected from the past and therefore we don't know or understand the true history of our land and our families. We're here today to honor the Confederate dead. And just recently, just recently, when trying to research my ancestry, and this speech is not about me or my ancestor, but just to say that I just found that one of my great uncles gave his life at Petersburg in the crater on the 30th of July, 1864. And he's buried at Doctors Creek Baptist Church right outside of Walterboro. If you haven't taken the time to go to cemeteries and find your ancestors, and if they and if they served in the Confederate Army, take a flag and put on that grave. It, it's important that we do that, that we let the world know that we still care about those men whether they died in the war or they survived it. Most of my ancestors survived the war. Today we stand right here in Barnwell, South Carolina. Late in the war for Southern independence in February of 1865, Barnwell was occupied by federal troops. They were under the command of a cavalry 
general named Hugh Judson Kilpatrick. And they came here in Barnwell and they stayed a few days. And they burned almost everything here, except for a few buildings and some churches. Everything was destroyed in Barnwell. And then when they left here, they went to Blackville. And they had some more fun in Blackwell, Blackville, burning there too. When Kilpatrick left here, he called it Burnwell. It's always important that we look to the scriptures to see what God has to say about events and about how we look at events. And I'm gonna I'm gonna take my hat off to read this. This is from Joshua chapter four, verses one through nine. When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Take twelve men from the people, each tribe a man, and command them, saying, Take twelve stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you, and lay them down in a place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe, and Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take each of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of tribes of the people of Israel, that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask in time to come, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, where it passed over the Jordan. The, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, so these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. As the people of Israel did just as Joshua commanded, and took up 12 stones out of the midst of the Jordan according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, just as the Lord told Joshua, and they carried them over to a place where they lodged and laid them down there. And Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan in a place where the feet of the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant had stood. And they are there to this day. One of the issues we have as Southerners and as descendants of Confederates is that these monuments are under attack. These monuments are under attack. Why do we put up monuments? Well, one reason why is it's biblical. I just gave you the scripture to back that up. The second reason is many of these young men fell on a battlefield far from home and they were left there in mass graves or in individual graves and they never made it back to South Carolina and these monuments are put up to remember those men and remember the sacrifice that's what these monuments are for these monuments are for exactly what Joshua said when your children ask you later hey Granddaddy or daddy or mom, what is that monument in that little funny shaped piece of land in Barnwell? What is that monument about? Guess what you can do then? You can tell them the true history of the South. Causes which were which were once lost or won on southern lands by southern sons, nobly fighting side by side. For us they fought, bled, and died. Everyone true and tried, dead though they be, they did not die in vain. Each hero's memory has come again, right here on Bentonville Battle Plain. As heroes they fell without a stain, true to the cause for which they fought. Each soldier's life was dearly bought. Veterans, we who wore the gray, each were clad in a battle array that met the foe from day to day, erect a monument to stay, round which we all have met today, a mound indeed, which is no trifle, nobly done by Goldsboro's rifle. 
Time may teach us to forgive, but it can never make us forget. Those words were uttered by Confederate General and South Carolina Governor Wade Hampton on March 20, 1895, as they dedicated a monument to the Goldsboro's Rifles. In the spring of 1866, the Ladies Memorial Association of Columbus, Georgia, passed a resolution to set aside one day annually to memorialize the Confederate war dead. Mary Ann Williams, the association's secretary, was directed to pen a letter inviting ladies' associations in every former Confederate state to join them in the observance. Their invitation was written in March 1866 and sent to all the principal cities in the former Confederacy, including Atlanta, Macon, Montgomery, Memphis, Richmond, St. Louis, Alexandria, Columbia, and New Orleans, as well as smaller towns like Staunton, Virginia, Anderson, South Carolina, and Wilmington, North Carolina. The actual date for the holiday was selected by Elizabeth Rutherford Ellis. She chose April 26, the first anniversary of Confederate General Johnson's surrender to Union Major General Sherman at Benton Place. For many in the Confederacy, that date marked the end of the war, but we know the war kept going after that. Tennessee Senator Edward W. Carmack in 1903 said this, the Confederate soldiers were our kinfolk and our heroes. We testify to the country our enduring fidelity to their memory. We commemorate their valor and devotion. There were some things that were not surrendered at Appomattox. We did not surrender our rights in history, nor was it one of the conditions of the surrender that unfriendly lips should be suffered to tell the story of the war, or that unfriendly hands should write the epitaphs of the Confederate dead. We have a right to teach our children the true history of the war the causes that led to it, and the principles involved. He said that in 1903. Do you see how things have changed in 119 years? Winston Churchill said this, the flags of the Confederate States of America were very important and a matter of great pride to those citizens living in the Confederacy. They are also a matter of great pride for their descendants as part of their heritage in history and they should be a matter of great pride the southern soldier was willing to go into battle and fight for the states to be free from northern occupation and northern tyranny they did this with much personal suffering and sacrifice they fought for their mothers their fathers their sisters their brothers i want to share with you a, an excerpt from a book that i recently read by Michael Thomas, who's a South Carolinian. The book is entitled Wade Hampton's Iron Scouts. And this passage comes from page 65. And here the author is chronicling the willingness of these brave men to leave the comfort and peace of their homes in South Carolina and return to the war and operate missions of gallantry, which were often fraught with risk of death or capture. There are no known reasons for any others in this group to return to Virginia. The scouts receive no extra pay or other privilege, privileges. Their role kept them in constant danger behind enemy lines for weeks at a time. Further, once detached from their commands, they were not eligible for promotion. The South Carolinians could have remained home close to their families and sweethearts and enjoyed regular home cooked meals and slept safely at night far from imminent danger. Yet they willingly gave all this up to return to scouting in Virginia. It is apparent they believed in the cause for which they fought and felt their contributions as scouts made a difference in the war. If you haven't read that book. It's called Wade Hampton's Iron Scouts. I encourage you to. The next is a poem by this 
the author is not credited. It says the marching armies of the past along our southern plains are sleeping now in quiet rest beneath southern rains. The bugle call is now in vain to rouse them from the dead. The arm to arms they'll never march again. They are sleeping with the dead. No more will Shiloh's plains be stained with blood our heroes shed, nor Chancellorsville resound again to our noble warriors tread. For them no more shall reveille sound at the break of dawn, but may they sleep peaceful till God's great judgment morn. We bow our heads in solemn prayer for those who wore the gray and clasp again their unseen hands on our Memorial Day. The memory and sacrifice of our ancestors should be cherished and taught to the future generations. This is where we have fa failed in this country, to teach the true history of our ancestors. This should be the job as Southerners that we do that that we teach the true history of the South. In 1281, Sir William Wallace, they made a movie about him. Y'all watch that movie? Braveheart. He said this, any society which suppresses the heritage of its conquered minorities, prevents their history or denies their symbols has sown the seeds of their own destruction. I want to share a quote from President Jefferson Davis. Davis said the following, nothing fills me with deeper sadness than to see a Southern man apologizing for the defense we made of our inheritance. Our cause was so just, so sacred, that had I known all that was to come to pass and had I known what was to be inflicted upon me, all that my country was to suffer, all that our posterity was to endure, I would do it all over again. Amen. Don't ever apologize for what a Southern soldier did in defending his country. He met an invading force that had overwhelming strength and he fought nobly for four years. And he fought bravely. I'm going to end with another quote from Wade Hampton. He said, if despair and sorrow and humiliation at last teach us to forget all these things, can we ever forget as we look upon the graves of our kindred, that gory sea of blood that has deluged our land? Can we fa fa farther forget, excuse me, can the father forget his boy struck down by his side in the very prime of manly strength and youthful beauty? Can the mother forget her darling, who fills now perhaps some bloody and unknown grave? Can the wife forget that husband who has to stay and comfort for her life? Yet, my friends, we must forget all that is we forgot or prove false to the principles for which we fought. Wade Hampton said it very clearly. We need to remember the brave men that served the South, and we need to honor them. God save the South. Awesome. All right, this time we go honor our ancestors by coming over to the bell. Also, I got water back there in the cooler. I forgot to tell you all.
Every year when I come to this podium, I like to remind you of four phrases that are written on this monument behind me. They were written by Robert Ulrich, who as a Confederate soldier in Virginia came to Barnwell at Christmas time and said, Mama, get Alfred to Augusta. I'll always love Augusta, Georgia. It was the hospital city in this area. But behind me on the monument, it ends with phrases by Alfred Aldrich, his brother, and his words are these. Despite everything, their spirits were never broken. Their courage never quailed. The convictions were never deserted. Their manhood was never surrendered. I believe those words describe men and women of this country today. My father was a World War I veteran. We have few World War II veterans yet alive. Around here today, we have men and women who are serving these United States. I want to read the names of five South Carolinians who died at the prison in Maryland. This book that I'm holding has more than 3,400 names of men who died at this prison in Maryland. They are all buried in mass graves. You can't visit a grave and put down a cross or anything like that. The man that wrote this book and compiled it has found 400 more names than those inscribed at this particular prison. It was the largest federal prison for Confederates. You see on my shoulder a red and a gray ribbon from Point Lookout. If a man lived there, and we have two, Ben Creech and Jerry Creech and I have great uncles, two of them, Uncle Lewis and Uncle George who lived. So I have two stars on the red side of that ribbon. It was there that they had to take the oath of allegiance. And when they took that oath of allegiance, they said in their vernacular that they were swallowing the yaller dog. Okay, another brother, John Jackson, he was sent from this prison to Elmira, and that's where he had to take the yaller dog. All of us have pledged our allegiance to one another and to our God who's made us free. Now I want to read the names of five South Carolinians that are buried at this prison in Maryland. The first one is Walter A. Bradford. He's 18 years old. He enlisted June 6, 1861 at Lawrence Courthouse, South Carolina. He resided in Lawrence County. His unit was Company A, the 3rd South Carolina Infantry. He was captured July 5, 1863 at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. He died of unknown causes here at this prison on February 15, 1864. The second one is Private J. H. Bradley, age unknown. He enlisted October 17, 1862 at Sumter, South Carolina. He lived in Sumter County. His unit was Company F, 7th South Carolina Cavalry. When he was captured is unknown and the date and cause of death is unknown. He's just a body. Third South Carolinian is Private John F. Brandt. He's 46 years old. He enlisted February 3, 1864 at Pocataligo 
in Jasper County, where he lived. His unit was Company C, 19th South Carolina Cavalry. He was captured March 5, 1865 at Florence, South Carolina. Now remember, he died right here in this state, right at the end of hostilities. Died of unknown causes, May 31, 1865. Number four that I read, this man's name is not on the monument at this prison, but Mr. Trieb found it. He is Private Thomas K. Bryce, age unknown, enlisted in May, May 5, 1862 at Charleston, South Carolina, where he lived. His unit was Company F, the 1st South Carolina Infantry. He was captured August 14, 1864, in Deep Bottom, Virginia. He died of chronic diarrhea, February 24, 1865. The fifth South Carolinian, and the last that I shall read, is Private Green H. Bridges, age unknown, enlisted February 17, 1863, at Charleston, where he lived. His unit was Company K, 27th South Carolina Infantry. Captured June 18, 1864 at Petersburg, Virginia and died of unknown causes, 7-26-1864. I feel that Robert Aldrich's words still live in all Americans today. We do have spirit we do have courage. We have what it takes to keep our land free. And for those reasons, we hold memorial services every year for all of our veterans, wherever they are. Now you ring the bell five times. I, I need to, my family owes a great debt of thanks to the Hilda camp uh, because the veteran that I'm going to mention is Henry Hain Dykes, who is buried out here in Slaytown on the old Dykes place. He was my grandmother's uncle and uh, he died at the Battle of Secessionsville in Charleston. The family went, sent a wagon down to Charleston and retrieved his remains and brought him back and buried him with his grandparents on the old grave, family grave site right there in Hilda. And because of the Hilda camp, they got a Confederate grave marker and have a Confederate soldier standing guard over great, great uncle uh, Henry Haynes' is, is, uh, grave. I have brought my wife, I've brought my grandchildren. My brother is the one that brought me to this place many years ago and I will continue to honor him Thank you, Hilda Camp. I'd like to honor my great great grandfather, Private Frank A. Brickle, served with 2nd South Carolina Company C down around Secessionville. Thank you. Thank you. Ring the bell. My great ancestor was Henry Bodiford, buried at Double Ponds. He was a private. Second Artillery, Second Infantry, South Carolina. I'm a product of the school systems in this country. 
I believe that the war between the states or the war for Southern independence, whichever way you want to call it, was fought over slavery. And then I met Jerry Creek. He enlightened me. I started doing the research. I proved that it had very little to do with slavery and everything to do with states' rights. Because we lost that war, we're still fighting that same battle. This recent Supreme Court uh, possible decision about abortion, all it's going to do is send it back to the states like the Tenth Amendment says it should be. The states will have a choice. Think about it. The whole battle was about states' rights. We lost. They made it about slavery, and nothing was fixed. So we're still fighting the same battle. In the process, I tried to find my ancestors so I could join the camp that was getting ready to form. My brother, my late brother, had done some research and I looked through all of his records and found two men that I thought had a good chance to have been Confederates. They were both from Florence County. I went to Florence County and spent hours trying to find their graves. They were buried within 10 feet of each other in the same cemetery. To my knowledge, they didn't even know each other. Both of them were my great-great-grandfathers. Both of them were lieutenants. Lieutenant Ezekiel Samuel Sauls and Lieutenant James Furman Rogers. Private Thomas Steele, Infantry, 17th Regiment, Company H. Lieutenant Noah Wolf, 17th Infantry, Sparkburg Reserves. Private William Henry Creek, 17th Infantry. Well, I'd like to tell you all this. My father had the pleasure of knowing him. He told him the way he, he was captured with Lee in Virginia, the way he stayed alive coming home was he picked the corn out of Yankees when you were boiled it, stay alive to get home. I'll never be ashamed of him. My ancestor is John F. Chitty. Private Company H of the 17th Regiment. I want to honor an ancestor from my wife's, from my mother's side of the family, Thomas J. Watts. He was in the 5th South Carolina County. He was born in 1820, died in 1871 in Aiken County. And his burial place is unknown. Joined SCV. Uh, all I had was a name, and I uh, went to the to the uh, what's called up there, the archive. The archive thank you. <laughs> then uh, researched him and found him, and I found out that he was a drummer. And I said, a drummer? My goodness, I want him to be a general or something, you know. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and Mickey Smith, who recruited me into the SCV, he said the drummers. Man, they were brave. They were up front. You know, and I thought about that thing. And his <laughs> name was William Edward Churchill of the Company C, 27th South Carolina Volunteer. My ancestor was Private John James Braxton, Company B, 2nd South Carolina Cavalry. And he was from Big Pork in the Barnwell District. So I have a kindred to the Hilda Camp and to Barnwell. After the war, he went to Strebin County, Georgia, and then he's buried there. So I'm, I'm mighty proud of J.J. Braxton.
the ancestor that joined the Sons of Confederate Veterans under is James Martin Johnson. He was from Springfield, South Carolina, and he's buried at a little church right outside of Nisus. He started out in the 20th South Carolina and he ended the war in the second in the infantry. And he's buried there at Rocky Swamp and right down from him is his brother who served with him, Pinckney Porter Johnson. And that's just a couple that we found so far. This time we will have a rifle salute and then we'll do pass. You have it on your program, prayer of units. We are grateful, dear Lord, for our poor Father. He gave us the Lord's heritage. Keep in our minds and hearts the spirit of the perfect and perfect. May we dedicate our lives to the fulfillment of service of the May the blessing of God. This time, we're not. We got to look away. Look away. All right, let's see. I wish I was in the land of cotton, old time fair, and I forgot to look away. Look away, look away, 
This concludes our program. I just thank everybody for taking their time to come out today. I know it's been hot, but it turned out to be a beautiful day. I want to thank everybody to help put this together. Patrick for doing the programs and everybody bringing everything and setting up. I just wish everybody a safe trip home. Also, the Fort Alexander reenactors for coming and doing what they do to help us each year to celebrate our ancestors. So thank you all very much. Uh, take time to read what's on the monument. This monument was put up here by the ladies of Barnwell. Uh, $500 of it was erected in 1900 to put this monument up, selling ice cream and oysters. So that's a combination, but they do that. So you need to read the scripture that's written on this monument. Thank you very much and have a blessed day. <laughs>